the, 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 there's an interesting thing um, in the administrator of Masa, and that that is that uh, if you're uh, any site, because you can have multiple sites running on a single instance, any site uh, has by default a limitation on the amount of content pages or content nodes it can have. It's a number which is uh, set uh, per site. Which you can edit, but I th I think if I'm not mistaken, the default number, standard number out of the box is 1,000, and we we did have uh, a couple of sites already where we had to raise the number uh, after a while because a thousand a thousand wouldn't be enough. Um, I Cold Fusion Alive, the podcast for the Cold Fusion community. Discover practices, tools, techniques, tips and trends for modern Cold Fusion development. Brought to you by TerraTech, the Cold Fusion experts. Develop, secure, optimize. Here is your host, the founder of TerraTech, Michaela Light. Welcome back to the show. I'm here with Gust Nieuwenhuis. If I didn't totally mangle up your Dutch or Belgium name, <laughs> is it Dutch or Belgium? I, I... Uh, a bit of both. A bit of both. Kind of a mixture yeah. there. And uh, he's joining us to talk about Massa CMS, a new CMS that launched about a year and a half ago. It's a uh, fork out of the uh, famous Mura CMS. And we'll talk about uh, why you even want to use a CMS at all. We've got some astounding statistics out of the Cold Fusion uh, State of the Union survey we run every year that I think are important regarding this. And uh, we'll also look at what's in Ma the features in Massa and then what's coming up in the future and why it's some really cool software. So welcome, Gust. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Yes, it's good to see you here. Uh, if you don't know him, he's a full sack web wizard, according to his bio. I don't know <laughs> what a web wizard is, but it sounds exciting. And uh, he's been doing Cold Fusion forever, um, working in Europe for the EU and NATO and Adobe and all kinds of clients that they have. And his uh, company, We Are North, they do customization as a service. So they uh, help customize solutions and get your apps running using Cold Fusion and probably Massa as well. Um, yeah. And he is an amateur musician uh, as well as a coach at a local football club. So welcome, Gust. Lo local soccer club for your uh, uh, Americans. Oh, for the Europeans oh, listening, yeah. it's soccer. For the, well, yes. no, for the Europeans. Or the Americans. But... <laughs> yes. Yeah. Let, let's yes. not get that discussion started. Otherwise, there will be no, no. time for Massa CMS anymore. Yeah. So, what, what, what is Massa? Um, what is Massa? Massa is, uh, first of all, uh, it's a cold fusion based content management system. Um, and I think, uh, hopefully, one day uh, we don't need to mention that anymore. But, but I still do today. It's a fork from uh, Mura CMS. Uh, I think a lot of people in the Cold Fusion community are familiar with Mura. Uh, and uh, we, uh, for various reasons, forked Mura a year and a half ago and created uh, our own version, Masa, Masa CMS. Okay, cool. Well, we'll talk about why you forked it. Uh, there was a good reason. Mm -hmm. But maybe we should answer the question what a CMS is and uh, why you might use a CMS. So what is a CMS? So well, CMS, first of all, stands for Content Management System. And the idea behind the CMS is that when you have a lot of content, uh, a lot of information that you want to visualize, um, that you have a central system where you put all that information in, and that's your management system, your content management system. And uh, an output of that content management system can can be very uh, various, can be a lot of things. Uh, but most commonly, it's a, a website. Um, but it could very well be a, a mobile app, for example. A content management system can, can power uh, content uh, in your in a mobile app. Um, and give you the opportunity to manage uh, online manager content that is eventually consumed and displayed in a mobile app. It can be a mobile app, can be uh, displays, 
um, if we're talking about uh, uh, about narrow casting, for example, could be that as well. Um, but most commonly, it's in the it's websites. Yeah. Um, and the the key feature for a content management system is that it allows to give you the ability to to create structure, to create overview, um, and uh, and have a lot of functionality around that content, so that it makes your life easier, um, especially for people that have to deal with the content and have to go through it, maintain it, update it. Um, yeah. So I, for me, the key thing, I mean, one of the alternatives, there are several alternatives to using mm -hmm. a CMS. Um, and we'll talk a bit more about the different CMS alternatives. But, you know, what I see in older programs, Cold Fusion apps, is all the content's hard coded directly mm -hmm. in CFM files. And then, of course, you know, if you want to change the content, you've got to, the users of from your organization have to they you have two options neither of which are great either they're making constant requests for changing the updates to the programmers and they end up in the queue of all the requests you have to do and changing content takes a longer time or the other alternative i've seen which is you know it's not great either you let the users edit those cold fusion files directly but then you're kind of at risk that they dork stuff up in your code um so on, on Either way, it's not good. So, so no, the content no, management no. system, the content goes in a database. You, the users log into a special admin area. They possibly have permissions as to what content they're allowed to update. They may have a workflow approval thing where someone, you know, an editor can do it, but someone else needs to approve it before it goes on the site. You, you have all kinds of much more granular control over your content in a CMS. Sorry, you were going to yeah. say, Gus. Yeah, I definitely don't think you should bother developers with uh, managing content. <laughs> that that for sure. I think I think all developers will will fully agree with me on that one. Um, but uh, so so that's pretty clear. A, a developer is not a um, it's not a webmaster. It's not somebody that's it's not a copywriter. So uh, eventually, if you rely on developers to update because it's hard coded, there's another guy in the process, another step, another possibility for a bottleneck somewhere. And that's definitely in today's world where marketing needs to go fast, needs to go quick. Not something you could uh, have another um, have another uh, bridge to cross whenever you're uh, whenever you're trying to put something out. Um, and and the second option you you mentioned uh, allowing. Um, Allowing people to directly edit uh, CFM, CFM, CFML pages themselves. Well, first of all, non you rather not have non-developers mocking around in your code, um, and otherwise they become developers, and they you don't want to have developers messing up your, or like dealing with your content. So I don't think that's a good solution either, especially. If you uh, look around tooling and functionality that's required to maintain a large portion of content, that can definitely be done in a development environment. We have something for versioning. It's called Git it's, or SVN. Um, but uh, we have we have a lot of tools for workflow we, uh, and all of that. But but that's most of the time outside of our code and therefore outside of the content if you keep content in code. Uh, mm -hmm. But what what you do get with a CMS is that with good CMSs is that there is ability to create workflows. There is versioning. It's all built in around the content in the CMS, and it gives all that power and functionality to your editors, to your authors, uh, to your publishers, to to your webmasters in general to to deal with that. Um, yeah, that's uh, that's what that's the key difference. Uh, for a uh, content management system. Yeah, you get more features. Mm -hmm. uh, we'll talk about the features that are in Massa uh, later in the show. I think it's also a safer way to edit content. It gives you better control of content edits if you've got a lot of people making content edits. More secure mm -hmm. as well. Um, so lots of reasons to do it. So let, let's have a, a, a look at what Cold Fusion developers say, CMS they said they were using in last year's uh, State of the CF Union survey. I'm just going to uh, share my uh, screen. Um, hopefully, you can see the graph in there. I don't know if I can make it bigger. Um, 
And for those who are listening on audio, I'll explain what's in there. Um, oops, somewhere I can make this bigger. <laughs> Let's try making it bigger. I'll do it. Um, so here we have um, some different options. The most popular CMS out there is custom or homegrown. A lot of people just roll their own CMS. You know, you, you stick some ta ta a table or two in your database, has the content in it, you have a simple admin screen, but you're missing out on a lot of the features that Massa or other CMSs uh, have there. Uh, and obviously you've got to maintain it yourself. Uh, and then other common uh, CMS is out there, Content Box, Mura, Preside, Far Cry, Contents, Common Spot. Some of those are open source like Massa. Um, th this, we didn't have Massa as an option last year, so don't be Ooh. upset, Gus, that it didn't. <laughs> no there worries. were some people who, who wrote it in under other. So uh, this year's survey, which just came out, does have it as an option. Um, Thank you. And um, But I, I think the thing that perhaps is uh, most interesting is Cold Fusion developers, 53% of Cold Fusion developers don't use any CMS, roll your own or any of these open source or commercial options. So uh, what, what, what are your thoughts on, on, on that? Why they, why do folks not, not use a CMS? Do you think? I, I, the, the difficulty I think here is that we don't know what, uh, what type of applications they're working on. It could very well be that that the type of applications they're working on are more like a file system or um, uh, completely different, but not related to content. Uh, mm. we, uh, we we don't do, uh, if, if I look at what we do, with the projects we do at, at, at We Are North, um, we don't use ACMS in every single project either. Uh, it's, mm -hmm. There's not always a use for, uh, mm -hmm. a CMS because it's not um, it's not around content. The, the application is sure. not around content. If we do have something that works around content, we do use a CMS, of course. Uh, yeah. That's for sure. And we, you mentioned earlier on um, the, the reason why we do that. And I think the reason why people should look into using a CMS as well um, is uh, what you mentioned at the beginning. With, with We Are North, what we do is customization as a service. And what we mean with that is that whenever we uh, we look, we help out a customer uh, mm -hmm. with a challenge they have, is that we try not to build from scratch. We have uh, a, a whole uh, cupboard filled with uh, with building blocks, um, and 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 we we use those, we we stick those together um, to make sure that we uh, we build a custom solution. Um, for our client, but reusing uh, different uh, systems, frameworks, libraries that are available, so that we don't have to start from scratch. We're we're um, we're pretty big Lego fans over at We Are North, so that's, uh, that's <laughs> probably why we why we're talking about building blocks and stuff like that a lot. Yes. Yeah. No, that makes sense. I mean, I think if it's if you got libraries or tools that make your life easier you might as well use them a cms mm -hmm. if if your cold fusion app does have content in it and i i would say yes there are apps that don't have content however most apps and if any public facing website is probably going to have some content going yeah. around in it even if you don't have a blog you probably have lots of informational web pages going on and then many internet Pay, you know, apps have content in, even if it's just a help system or something. So, mm -hmm. um, I think those 53% of people listening who like, well, I don't use a CMS, um, might want to contemplate, uh, okay, there are places where we have content in the site. It would be nice if users were able to update that within our organization, uh, for either their own use or for the public. Um, and, um, you know, consider using one of the CMSs. Um, I, I also just want to mention, you know, the the top actual CMS was Content Box in the survey, but Mura was pretty close behind. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I think given Master is very similar to Mura because you forked off a private, mm -hmm. you know, the previous version. Maybe we should talk about why you decided to fork from it because sometimes forking software is controversial. 
Um, but I don't think it was in this case. So t- tell us about why you did the fork a year and a half ago. Um, so we, we've been we've been using Mura a, a lot before. Uh, we mm. we we loved it. It's it it always always has been. I think definitely the last few years was was the leading CMS definitely in the cold fusion world, but a real challenger for for um, for the CF, CMS world in general. Um, mm-hmm. But what happened um, about uh, I think about two years ago is that they announced they were gonna go uh, closed source again with uh, the new version oh. of Mura they were building. So Mura, okay. just just to make make it clear, Mura started off as a closed source uh, mm-hmm. content management system, up to version I think five dot something, five dot three, five dot four, around that time. Uh, they mm-hmm. they made they made it uh, open source, uh, mm-hmm. and then through the years, for years, uh, with with major and minor releases, all the way up to seven dot two, uh, it was released under a uh, close uh, an open source version. But while developing uh, a new version, while developing and uh, working towards uh, what they call Mura X, uh, the latest version of Mura. They mm-hmm. uh, they decided they wanted to uh, move back to a closed source uh, oh. licensing model, and okay. um, it kind of out of the blue took the whole repository offline, the open source repository as well. Mm-hmm. They did open it up privately to uh, people who asked for it, so okay. they that there there's still a private repository out there on GitHub that that some of us have access to, but. Mm-hmm. Um, but since uh, August uh, 2021, I even think, um, yeah, mm-hmm. August 2021. Since then, they um, uh, they they stopped uh, maintaining and uh, adding new uh, code to the to the the open source version. And um, so, why did you want there to be an open source, you know, CMS? I guess based on Mira, the earlier version of Mira 7.1, that but you wanted to keep on developing it. Why, why did you think that was important in the cold fusion world that was an, that was an open source CMS? What, 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 we experienced, what we experienced with We Are North and uh, with some of our clients, but we weren't the only ones. We, we were approached by other companies as well that, that, that were struggling with the same, same thing, is that, um, and I actually talked to one of, uh, a company today as well, and, and they explained me the same thing. The reason why they're, started looking into Masa is exactly why we decided to fork it. And that is that um, we were not in a position for some of our clients to move to a closed source model. Um, and sometimes in some cases, that's because of financial reasons. There's just no budget uh, foreseen. It's not that there's no budget, but it's just, it's not budgeted to have uh, a license cost. Um, in in other cases, it's just the way the contract with the client has been written is that they, it's built. There, there's a requirement to use open source software, and we see that, we see that a lot in in Europe, for example, for, uh, coming from government organizations or government itself, that, that, that there's a requirement to work with open source software, um, and uh, so so. That's what we experienced, and we weren't alone. And we we were approached by uh, a few companies, um, and and that eventually made us think: okay, what can we do? What are the options? And we started looking into: okay, maybe we should continue it ourselves. Uh, we mm-hmm. haven't. We we at first we were thinking: okay, well, we're already running on the latest open source version. We'll just make sure that if anything happens, we'll fix the bug in in the core, and mm. it's okay. Mm-hmm. But since more and more people started uh, approaching us, we we thought: okay, maybe maybe we should should do what we're planning to do anyway, but do it mm. out in the public with a fork and uh, mm-hmm. of the of the uh, of Mura, and that's that's what eventually happened. Um, mm. There was some preparation. Uh, it, it took quite a few months of preparation to come out with with a fork. Uh, mm-hmm. We did our due diligence on a legal legal level, uh, mm-hmm. and we had to, of course, make sure that we, um, by the time we we forked it, we we had it renamed because of branding uh, and because mm-hmm. of trademarks on uh, mm-hmm. by by Blue River on Mura. 
So we rebranded it, uh, went through the code, uh, fixed it everywhere we needed it. Uh, mm -hmm. Dealt with a few issues that we came across, um, mm -hmm. dependencies on, on commercial licenses that we couldn't take along. So we 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 fixed that mm. with some some uh, some fixes, um, and then uh, I think a year and a half ago, somewhere at the end of summer, twenty twenty one, yeah, this, the end of the summer twenty twenty one, we we released seven dot two, Massa CMS version seven dot two, following up on uh, Mura seven dot one. That is great that you did that. So congrats on taking on that project. Uh, great for the Confusion community that the Massa CMS open source legacy continues through, uh, sorry, the Mura open source mm -hmm. <laughs> CMS legacy continues through Massa. And uh, thanks for making sure. It, obviously, it has to be all done you know, above board and legally. And, and for folks listening, you know, I know some people are totally into the open source world, but not everyone who does, does Cold Fusion, you know, is is a, familiar with open source. So open source means that the, the, the software, uh, you can get the source code, hence open source. It's also under a license that lets you modify it for your own tweaking around. There may be some restrictions on that, you, you know, as to what you can do. Um, depends on the lot. What, what license do you guys use? Do you, Ooh, uh, <laughs> I should be able to answer this question right away. Uh, well, we'll add I'll, it in the show notes later. You can answer it later. It's uh, no worries. It's but a meanwhile, GPL, let, let it, it's a GPL two. The GPL. Yeah. Oh, no. Yeah. Okay, so that's a common uh, um, open source license. And just to be clear, for people who haven't been involved in in forking. Basically, anyone who uses any open source software is free at any time. Make a copy of it, tweak around with it, make your own version of it, you know, under certain restrictions as to what you're allowed to do. Um, but it's pretty free. I mean, the restrictions are pretty minor. Yeah, and so it's totally on. legal and encouraged to make a fork mm -hmm. of open source software. And this is a very common thing in the open source world. And if the fork turns out to be, you know, it's better and more popular and it's easier to use, you know, it gets it, more people adopt it. So it's kind of a democratic way of, of dealing with things. And it avoids, you know, often with commercial software, people get upset. Oh, well, why doesn't it do this? Or I wish it did that with open source. You don't like the way it is. You edit it, you make it do better. You put back a pull request to the original people. If they like your modification, they could accept it. Mm -hmm. That's basically how it works. Now, in this case, the prior version of Mura was open source. Um, they made a new version that was closed source. In other words, commercial software that you're not allowed to do these things with. But you were still allowed to take the previous version and fork it into an, into the, into Massa. Yeah, indeed. Indeed. All right. And and if All you right. look at if you look at those open source licenses, they always um, it's they it, the open source license because there are different versions and different templates for it. It basically defines what the permissions are, what you're allowed to do, what your limitations are, and what the conditions are uh, for uh, that that apply on on what you're doing. And um, mm -hmm. And in our case, with with the GPL v2, uh, and that's that's all clearly displayed on uh, on our GitHub. GitHub has a really nice uh, page for that on our GitHub uh, repository. The, the permissions are are that you could use uh, use it commercially, you can modify it, you can distribute it, you can use it privately. Uh, but there is a limitation, which is that there is no liability. We cannot be held liable, uh, and there is no warranty from our side. Um, and and all of that under the condition that you keep the license and the copyright notice that you um, that you disclose this, uh, the source and that you have whatever you do with it. If you fork it, you need to continue under the same license. Uh, that's in a nutshell what our license, uh, what the GPL that we use stands for. Yeah. Yeah, it's a very common open source license. So yeah. that last point means someone can't. Anyone can make a new open source version of Massa if they if mm -hmm. they have a cool idea. They're like, "Hey, we want it to have this feature." They can add it in. What they can't do is turn around and make it closed source and then start charging money for it. 
And now, and now people will wonder how come Miura did do that uh, because they were under oh. the same license as was as what we are. Yes. Saying. But there's a big difference, and that is that is copyright. And oh. um, and they they been developing Miura for years and years, and yes. what, and they hold copyright over what they did. Um, yeah, and they so, created it, so they're yeah. allowed to do that. Yeah, so that that so. makes makes them allowed to do that. Yeah, yeah, but it's and just it's it's just not possible for anyone else to take it. And they say, "I make it closed source." That's that's no. where the limitation uh, the limitation. This podcast is brought to you by TerraTech, the cold fusion experts. Develop, secure, optimize. Get detailed show notes on today's episode and your free CF Alive Modern Cold Fusion Guide at terratech.com. That is T E R A T E C H dot C O M. And now back to today's show. I, I know you, Anya, I went to your website and you say it's an enterprise content management system. Sounds very sexy, but what, what does that mean, enterprise content management? <laughs> Oh, you're the first one to to <laughs> the first one to tell me that enterprise is sexy. Sexy. I think most people will <laughs> will uh, think the complete op- opposite of it. But no. Um, well, so- you, usually when you go to a SaaS or some software, they have like here's the 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 small business one, and then you want to pay more money. I know you don't charge money for Massa, but often they have an option. You know, small business, and then there's the enterprise version, and it costs more because it has more features. Yeah. So what think, what makes Massa an enterprise content management system? I, uh, I think what, uh, what not, I don't think that I I do know that uh, where where Massa is strong at is uh, the workflow and the possibilities and the tools for ed- editors and authors to um, to deal with content and especially when we're talking about workflow. The abilities for approval, change, content staging—that's that's some pretty advanced functionality for a CMS, and that's where it makes it um, enterprise. If if uh, if you're, uh, and I'm not saying that Masa is not suited for small business. Masa is definitely suited for small businesses as well. But the moment you're working in an enterprise environment with a lot of people that have uh, responsibility and 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 that are involved in uh, content management, you need functionality to be able to, for example, have a person A write content, person B review it, person C being illegal, uh, doing a legal review, uh, and all of that happening in parallel over multiple uh, content nodes. And then all those content nodes come together in a single publish date, for example, uh, and a whole set of content to go live all together. That mm. th- that's that's some serious so version, enterprise functionality. You have versioning as well. Yeah, yeah, so, indeed. And then indeed. the content staging is where you can look at a, a version before it gets published and see is it all consistent and good. Mm-hmm. It, um, Very cool. I think I I, I, ref- I regularly reference a uh, a business case here in Belgium. I don't I don't know how it is. Uh, around the world in other countries, but whenever um, whenever sales happens for stores, there's some pretty tight uh, regulation on uh, what companies and, and stores are allowed to do with sales and discounts. Mm. Um, and oh. we have we in Belgium we have twice a year there is a period with, which we call solde or sales, uh, and where especially a, a good example is uh, clothing stores. Where they basically uh, anything which is from last season, they put it on sale uh, and have and sell it at big discounts. Everybody's uh, pretty um, used to to that. I think it's a common mm-hmm. common common thing. Um, but in Belgium, it's regulated onto two periods in the year where that is uh, comp- uh, shops are allowed to do that, and even wow. more. The I think a period of one month, four weeks prior to that sales uh, sales period mm-hmm. starting, they're not allowed to do any type of discounts. Um, wow! And that's it. That's an interesting use case. And if you want to mm-hmm. translate that to a website or a web shop, for mm-hmm. example, um, yeah. you want to prepare that 
You want to prepare mm. the content. You want to prepare mm-hmm. all the information, all the marketing you're going to do around those, that sales period. And you want to, uh, you don't want to overnight make all those changes and put them live. No. So basically, what you have is uh, weeks or months of months of preparation, updating content and everything, and which is all kept in draft. Um, mm-hmm. And what you then can do in 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 Masa is you bundle that in a content content set um which you can preview preview so you can basically open the website when you're logged in as as an editor you can open the website and look at a preview version of the website and everything is bundled all together so that it can go live all together right when the sales period starts and it's that kind of functionality that that we call enterprise and even more i'll tell you <laughs> A funny thing is that one of the two sales periods in Belgium starts on uh, January 1st. Um, mm-hmm. I don't think anyone wants to be responsible for uh, on New Year's Eve being the one who needs to push a button on at midnight when your friends are popping the corks of the bottles of champagne. You don't want to be the one yes. working to put the website live, uh, the, the, the change that live. So there is automatic, you can... You can schedule publishing, for example, as well. It's it's that kind of functionality. You can basically okay, have all, so you can all put a date that. and time for publishing yeah. a set of content. And yeah, for people indeed. who don't live in Belgium, which is probably ninety nine point seven percent of our <laughs> listeners, um, you may have a product launch that has to launch on a certain That's marketing a window. Thing, yeah. So a similar uh, thing. Mm-hmm. Um, so it's useful. Or you may have some press release that's coming out and. It needs to be embargoed until a certain day and time, and you need supporting content that comes Indeed. up. Yeah, so, those are those um, are some very valid use cases as well for that that type of enterprise functionality. Yeah, yeah. So let let's talk in more detail about the technical features that are in mm-hmm. Massa. Uh, it looks like you've got some really cool things you've got in there. I saw you've got a layout manager and themes and plugins yeah. and all kinds of things. So tell us a bit more about. The, the cool stuff you can do using Massa? Um, I, I think I, I definitely want to highlight one of the, the more recent things that's, uh, that's very powerful. Uh, and I, I must give credit to, to Mura for this. Um, uh, that's the layout manager. Um, mm. it, it's, it's maybe, uh, it's, it's something which is probably not very known to the general public uh, what this functionality in, in Massa is. It's, it's the ability to basically have a set of modules that you can drag and drop onto the page. Um, oh, how cool. We're, we're switched. Yeah. In this case, in this use case, what you do is that you don't, you, you do not edit the, the content of a certain page in, in the backend in the administrator, but you edit it directly in line in the, in the website itself. Um, Masa is this cool little edit bar. Once you're logged in with the the, the right permissions, you you have an edit bar, um, and with, on whatever page you are on your website, you basically uh, click edit and you go to inline edit. A nice sidebar pops up, and you can mm-hmm. drag and drop uh, a lot of uh, nice and cool modules onto the page. Um, mm. That that can be a, a text module where you can you put some text in, or you can reuse. Uh, other bits of text, text that you already have in your in your system, you could put. Uh, you could use gallery features. You could um, you could drag in a a, vid, um, a module that allows you to set a, a video, a YouTube video, for example, um, which is automatically rendered for you. Um, and that way, you could basically build up the website. Uh, that's that's a very very powerful feature, I think, in uh, in Masa. And what we've been uh, been doing recently, uh, especially in version seven seven four, is that we we went through all those modules you could drag and drop onto the page, uh, and we we reviewed every single one of them, uh, made sure we 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 tested them, we've updated them with some functionality, and there were a bunch of uh, old. Um, Mura in the past used to have this notion of a display object, and it, it's actually the display object that evolved into those modules. But some of those old display object nev- the objects never made the transition into modules, um, oh. and that's what we what we we fixed in seven four. 
uh, and make sure that you have uh, uh, all those missing modules uh, in Masa so you can really build up build up a website. Um, that, that's great how you didn't just copy Mura 7.1. You've been adding features, yeah. making it yeah. better. So Indeed, there's um, a... There's a new file browser in the administrator as well. That's been uh, we've oh. we've replaced CK Finder with a, a custom built file browser, um, and and we've updated uh, the whole uh, interface for editing content in the administrator as well, where we made it more usable, more flexible, um, easier. Usability is a is a key feature for uh, for Massa for sure. Uh, and that's why we we a lot of new usability upgrades and improvements that we did on that app. Yes, that is cool. Now themes, I assume that's like you can apply a whole look and feel to the site yeah. by changing the theme, mm -hmm. and you can either write your own themes or you can just there are themes other people have written that you can start off with. Yeah, and and really cool. Uh, what you can do with those themes is you in those themes you can add your custom modules. So the modules I just talked about, if you just want to drag a piece uh, a piece of content on the page or a video or an image, uh, or you write in your theme a bunch of custom modules that represents different layouts or, or widgets or uh, little blocks uh, that you that you want to provide and have available for your editors. You could basically build them in your theme as well um, and, and, and deliver them to, to content editors that way. And that's, that's, I think, one of the most powerful features uh, there is. The ability mm -hmm. uh, for editors to not just only use the standard built-in uh, modules that come out of the box, but the ability for developers to build custom ones and for, for editors to use those uh, custom ones um when when managing the content yeah now i i know you also have plugins T tell us a bit about that so i assume a way to customize uh and encapsulate uh code and, and uh, let people add add it in or yeah so so the the big difference between modules on one end and plugins on the other side is that uh modules um the modules could very well be uh, something which uh, it can have a uh, front-end uh, interface element you can drag on the page. It doesn't need to. Um, but plugins do not have that ability. Where do plugins differentiate from modules then is that plugins have the ability to create um, an interface in the administrator, which is not possible through a module. So a plugin is... is, uh, is um, Something is which is way more geared towards the administrative, the administrator, and, and and that side of the application where modules are geared more towards the front end uh, editing and the layout manager. And do yeah. plugins tie into events within Massa? Yes. Or? yes. Okay. Uh, Massa has a, a very very rich event lifecycle as well as a lot of. Um, specific events around uh, functionality in the application. So, uh, and, and Masa has, an, has two types of events. Um, and you can, you can see the difference between the events already in the name. Uh, any events that starts with uh, on, uh, for example, on content safe, um, are events that are, uh, when they are triggered, they are, they are hooks into, into the workflow, into the life cycle where you can add extra bits and pieces of content. And next to that, the whole life cycle has uh, a lot of events that start with the word standard. And those events, they, uh, any code you put in there, you replace the code that would normally be executed. Um, so that's, that's the, the two types of events that there are. And, and there is a huge list. Huge, huge, um, uh, and and the amount of hooks are are, are uh, uh, endless. Um, to give you an example, if you uh, there is an event, there is an event all, uh, on uh, before content safe, uh, which allows you to manipulate the content before it's been saved, uh, as well as there is uh, an event on after content safe which allows you to do something after the content has been saved in the system. So it's even those small um, 
differences and and, and yeah that allow you to to do a lot of a uh, lot of cool stuff with it. Uh, one of the sites recently uh, that I've I've been working on, I used the on before content save um, for a specific type of content, which um, let me now let's quickly, which means that I have a dynamic event name, which is basically on uh, uh, oh <laughs> it, it it it's gone. Um, no worries. What I'm, what I'm so, so if, if people are into to event-driven programming and object-oriented programming, mm -hmm. they're going to have a love fest with Massa. Oh yeah, or, um, yeah, understanding. Yeah, yeah. And if you're not into object-oriented programming, you can still use Massa. Yeah, you you mm -hmm. just don't you just don't get all that extra yeah. benefit of using the events and things. Talking about if if you're talking about so we have the whole events. Um, everything around events in in Masa. The other thing that we have in Masa is is an ORM assembler and a lot of functionality to create your own objects um, uh, and uh, basically play with those on on an OOP side of things. There's a lot of of that as well, um, which which makes it really easy. Uh, for example, to create um, a lot of content which should not be tied into content nodes in a site. Uh, mm. structure, but are independent from the site structure um, and allow you to to use those. Uh, it's just a different way of structuring your content, basically. And do you expose an API to Massa? Or? Yeah, so um, there is uh, there is uh, when you're building on the front end, mm -hmm. when you're in, in your code working with uh, with JavaScript, there is uh, there is the ability to use a, a JavaScript API uh, in your frontend uh, code and to basically interact with with the backend of the system, as well as there is uh, there are uh, endpoints API endpoints to uh, integrate with uh, to integrate Masa into external systems uh, and to have um, a nice integration with whatever mm. other tool you have. Uh, mm -hmm. in your workflow, whatever old other building block you're using um, when when uh, creating something for a client. Yeah, that's great. I, I'm curious. Do you use the Adobe API Manager f f to help with your APIs? Or uh, I I haven't looked into that specifically yet, uh, mm. but I know what the strength and the power is of the API Manager, and that would definitely um, that that could definitely be of be of help. Yeah. In, I think in, I, I would say in particular use cases, uh, if yes. if you're um, if you're using Masa as a content management system for a public website, no, not so much. But um, imagine that you use Masa as a content management system to manage a lot of content that you will then distribute through APIs with limitations and security and, and authentication and all of that on that content. Yeah, then I think mm -hmm. the, the Cold Fusion, the Adobe Cold Fusion API manager would come in uh, very useful to uh, to manage a lot of that incoming traffic before it yes. before it uh, reaches Massa. Yeah. yeah, for better control and security. Yeah. I did an interview with Mike Brunt uh, last week about using the API manager for better API security. Mm -hmm. So that's what brought it to mind. Um, I was reading through your docs. You have a thing called an M tag. It sounds kind of magical and mysterious. What, <laughs> what is? There is a, um, um, wait, uh, yeah. So the M tag uh, allows, um, it's, it's a very, very powerful little thing. Whenever somebody's editing content and inside the content they're working with, they need something dynamic, something out of the system, for example, they can use that M tech uh, to basically add a little bit of code. It's a way of adding oh. a bit of code and dynamic functionality to your content. Mm -hmm. um, oh. And it's it's basically, it's, uh, it's not a tag the way we know it, uh, for mm -hmm. cold fusion with with uh, greater than and smaller than uh but mm -hmm. it's 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 using brackets so it's uh, mm -hmm. it starts with brackets with an m 
and then you put mm -hmm. a little bit of code and then you close it with uh, brackets with a slash M oh, uh, okay. to close it. So it's it's very similar to the text we know from Cold Fusion, but, but slightly mm -hmm. slightly different. And it allows allows you to do some basic stuff inside of your content. Uh, mm. Yeah, to do that. And then what you do most of the time is that you, you could, for example, call a Cold Fusion function. If you, for example, um, if you want to add the current date onto a page, for example, with directly into your content, you would, you would use the now cold fusion now function and you probably do date format around it. And it's basically, it's rendering that on the page. What you could also do on top of the M tag is that inside the M tag, you use the, the massa scope and the massa scope is basically is, uh, uh, starts with just M dot. And uh, you could do them m dot get content, and you could ask for a specific content node and get a property out of a content node, for example. That could very well be the content node of the page you're currently on. It could be coming from somewhere else in the system. Yeah. Mm. Now you you mentioned you support workflows in Massa. Mm -hmm. Can you customize those? You can set up a, different groups of people who get content yes. for approval or editing. Yeah, you can you can use the the users and the group functionality to to set up groups, and then you create a workflow in which you basically say, okay, first somebody from this group of people needs to approve before it moves on to the next group of people. Somebody there needs to approve it, and then you can basically chain chain those approvals so that before it's being published, uh, multiple mm. uh, people have look, looked through it, uh, and that could be. Um, uh, if you have authors and, and once they're done writing a page for your website, it goes to uh, a group of, a group of editors that will review it, review the content, review the language mm -hmm. that's being used. And when they approve it, it goes to legal. Uh, it goes mm -hmm. to market, marketing first, maybe, and marketing looks at it and sees if everything's okay. And they approve it and it goes to legal. And then, well, legal, uh, when legal says there's no issue with it. The chain can be endless. The chain can be endless. Oh, you you okay. might not want to do that because otherwise you'll never end up <laughs> probably not. You probably, but yes. um but yes, indeed, you could do that. A and if then, you're okay. Yeah, go ahead. And 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 in that whole process, people get notified. People mm -hmm. people can can see in the administrator what what content is mm -hmm. there and is waiting for approval by by them. Mm -hmm. Um Editors uh, that uh, authors can can see where the content is in that chain of approval, uh, mm -hmm. and emails can be sent out automatically to to inform people something is mm -hmm. waiting for their approval and so on. So, yeah, very cool. So I, I don't know if you're allowed to share anonymously some statistics about Massa. Like, you know, do, do you know how many pages some of your larger sites have? Offhand, you know, or oh, uh, I how think, many, I think how one many of the, content users they have. Or? Um, I, so the, 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 there's an interesting thing um, in the administrator of Masa, and that that is that uh, if you're uh, any site, because you can have multiple sites running on a single instance. Any site uh, has by default a limitation on the amount of content pages or content nodes it can have. It's a number which is uh, set uh, per site, which you can edit. But I, th I think if I'm not mistaken, the default number, standard number out of the box is 1000. And we, we did have uh, a couple of sites already where we had to raise the number uh, after a while, because a thousand, a thousand wouldn't be enough. Um, I think one of the bigger systems, uh, that bigger size that I worked on had, uh, was a, a, a website for, uh, let, let's call it a school, an organization organizing a lot of trainings. Um, and every single training, as well as every, uh, class, for that course, so every single course and every single class they organize for a specific course, all of each of them were content nodes. And if you then uh, do the math, the site was running uh, for 15 years already. Um, you can you can imagine that that gives a, a pretty that we're talking about a, few, a couple of thousand content content nodes in a single uh, instance, single site. 
Yeah. And then what about users, you know, content editors, approvers, legal marketing, all that? Uh, one of our one of our clients, I don't know, I don't have exact numbers, but I know that one of our clients has uh, a very big uh, user base uh, talking about editors, uh, authors, and so on that runs into like, somewhere, I think, in t- between 100 and 150 people easily. Um, so, so yeah, it, it, there's a, uh, it can, it wow. can definitely handle, handle a lot of, a lot of users. And there's no limit on how many you can have there. If you've got a big no. organization, you can have as many of those as you want. Yeah, indeed. indeed. And you're yeah. not paying an extra licensing fee, fee for every content editor. Nope. Nope. No. That's, uh, that's not the case at all. No. Yeah. Um, let, let's talk about backwards compatibility because so, maybe some of the people who are using Mura would like to transition over to Massa. How hard mm-hmm. is it to do that? Um, uh, if you're on uh, the latest version of Mura, it's uh, it's super easy. Um, there's uh, somewhere do you, in the. Do you mean Mura 10 or Mura 7? No, it's sorry. Sorry. Uh, uh, if you're on the latest version, of, uh, if you're on the latest public uh, open source version of Mura, uh, if you're on seven four, it's uh, it's mm-hmm. super straightforward. There is a configuration file. You change uh, an endpoint where we download the code from. Uh, you change it from a Mura endpoint to uh, our Masa endpoint on GitHub. Um, you go into the administrator. You hit update, and the whole site updates to Masa. Um, if you're on uh, and and then if you go back, if you're on seven zero, um, it depends a little bit. That same technique works uh, uh, sometimes as well. With uh, but if you go to version six dot five, six dot four, there are, there are are some quirks because that functionality didn't ex- with that URL didn't exist like that in those versions. So you cannot just update the URL. You need, you need to do a little bit more, but but that's something that uh, people can always reach out to us for help. Uh, we've over the last year and a half, we've been updating a lot of uh, websites, even from version five, version six, all the uh, of Mura all the way up uh, to the latest version of Masa. Um, Ma, uh, I know that that Matt, the lead developer on on Mura in the past, has always been very has been very keen on backwards compatibility from Mura. Um, uh, and then when talking about Masa, I'm a strong believer in the semantic in the semantic versioning uh, model, um, where you clearly base there your version number indicates uh, if um, if there is a potential for breaking changes or not. So maybe to quickly to quickly explain that a bit, a bit because maybe not everybody is familiar with semantic versioning. Um, I think a lot of people are are familiar with a version numbering that uh, that's that has three parts. For example, one dot zero dot zero. Um, the first number stands for the major for major versions. The second number stands for minor versions, and the third number stands for patch versions. So 1.0.0 is a major version, version 1. Uh, if you have 1.0.1, is a the first patch version on top of major version 1. And then if you have 1.1.0, is uh, the, a minor version. What's important here, and when we're talking about, about backwards compatibility, the, uh, compatibility, the idea is that Whenever you release a new version, and that new version contains, for example, a small bug fix um, or some something that's uh, broken and needs to be fixed, you do that in a patch version. So if you release uh, a version with a couple of small, smaller bug fixes, then you basically you take the latest version number you have and you add you increment the third number by one. Um, if you uh, release a version that contains new functionality uh, but has no breaking changes, that's considered a minor version. And then you raise the minor number, so the middle number of the three, you raise that by one, and you um, uh, reset the patch number to zero. So that way you go from, for example, 1.0.1, uh, 0. 1, you go to 1.1.0. Uh, and whenever you 
make a big, big change in your application, or you you look into making breaking changes, um, that's when you uh, define the version as a major release. Um, that's that's a, that's a change between Masa and Mura because Mura was not using semantic versioning uh, in in that way. We we are applying semantic version versioning pretty strictly. Um, Maybe which means you could, that maybe you could educate Chrome and Firefox to use this, so they're not <laughs> going into some enormous version number every five minutes. No, indeed, indeed. Um, but but it's it's we use that, and which basically uh, which basically means that whenever you look at our version numbering, you immediately know uh, is there a risk? Mm -hmm. Is this going yes. to introduce new functionality? Well, that's or good. Not? Because new functionality might mean that you, uh, it might not break something, but it might mean that mm -hmm. you need to educate your users, or it might mean that you need to up update yes. videos and documentation right. you made internally for people to use your system. Um, now, while we're educating, maybe we can educate the Lucy Association in Switzerland and Adobe uh, on their version numbering, because sometimes hotfixes from Adobe have broken stuff. They're not backwards compatible. Uh, not often, but that did happen last year. And then on the other end of the spectrum, it seems to me Lucy has had a zillion major changes, but they don't bump their major version number. <laughs> um, well, well, there's there's no need to bump your major version number with a lot of changes. Oh. Um, well, it's I just... know, but for marketing purposes, if you've done a lot of work and you've made some major improvements, maybe you should increase the major version number. If we're comparing um, uh, approaches in versioning uh, with different yes. library, libraries and, and, and products and so on, um, mm. what I the one I really love is what Ember.js does. Ember.js mm. is uh, one of the lesser known front-end frameworks. Uh, it's, mm -hmm. it's, it's been out there for way longer uh, than Angular and Vue and React, for example, but, but it's mm -hmm. a... It's a a lesser known one. What they do is um, they have a very, and I wish I could do that with Masa one day, but we're not there yet. Um, they have a very strict release schedule. They release a minor version every six weeks, period. Every six, week, wow. six weeks, there is a new minor version. Okay. Um, and what they, uh, that basically means that any company using Ember JS for their, um, mm -hmm. uh, in their, in their product or in their project, they know mm. and they can schedule ahead for upgrades mm -hmm. to happen in Ember. And mm. on top of that, uh, all new functionality is always added to minor releases. And the moment, and it's a bit similar to what you're, you were saying, the moment that mm. they consider the amount of functionality they added to uh, in minor versions to be a like a lot, they will then release a major version but the major mm -hmm. version will not contain any new functionality. It'll basically be like a milestone they set. And what they might do at that point is um, have uh, a lot of um, deprecations that they announced prior to, to throw them out and therefore create breaking changes. So that's that's the way they work, uh, work with that. Really, they have that documented on their website. It's really interesting to, to uh, read how they approach it because I, I personally think uh, that's... Uh, that's uh, a tremendous way of doing it. Yeah, that is, and you know, and to be Lucy, I think they have a monthly release cycle. From what I can remember, they have like mm -hmm. a sprint, and every month they, re unless there was a security thing that needs to be addressed immediately, mm -hmm. they just release new stuff every month on a release cycle. I, I talked to Patrick Quinn, who was involved in that at the time, um, and they, they, they're pretty good at rolling out new features. So. Um, and then uh, Adobe, of course, have a two-year major release cycle, and they just basically do hot fixes for security issues in between, mm, yeah. or bug fixes. Well, um, it, it, so they have a bit of a different philosophy there. It, well, talking about Adobe, if they're releasing um, fixes through uh, bug fixes and security vulnerabilities through hot fixes, then of course they shouldn't break. Uh, existing functionality. I don't know. I'm not. I'm not sure whether they do that on purpose. I think think that just sometimes happens, unfortunately. Um, but 
But if they would do that, I'm, I'm not. I don't think they would do do that on on purpose. Um, cold fusion. Got I think close, Adobe close Cold Fusion commercial Adobe. software and open source have two different versioning kind of yeah. patterns, right? With the commercial software, you want people to pay for the update license, mm -hmm. and so you need to have a whole, you know, have to have useful things that are improved, right? Mm -hmm. Well, with open source, you're not getting paid for adding new features so you might as well just release them as you implement them to get feedback and yeah uh, indeed. get them out there so it's a bit of a different animal speaking mm -hmm. of adobe and lucy do, does massa run on both adobe cold fusion and lucy cold fusion or yes um the uh the only little note little mark i need to make is that i'm not 100 percent sure that uh everything works fine on adobe 2021 um one of the one of the pro one of the things I'm currently working on with, uh, on with Masa is that I'm I'm creating a set of environments that we can actually test against, um, and that that's basically different versions of Lucy, different versions of ACF, uh, but uh, different database engines as well. And I'm basically mm. creating creating a metric. I've got a met metrics. What what database do you work with? Uh, databases that are supported are uh, MySQL, Postgres. Uh, Oracle and MSQL, um, SQL Server, and the last one. Uh, so those are for four database engines that are supported. Um, and then Adobe, uh, Cold Fusion, and Lucy are the CFML engines. Uh, and it's basically, I'm creating a, a toolbox of different, um, to be able to combine the different engines with the different, and different versions of the different engines with different databases. Uh, and that way be able to when we when we prepare a release that we basically do testing against all those versions that's uh, uh mm. and and once i've got that ready uh, i'm planning on on uh making that available uh to to the community as well so that people could use that um and then put put a copy of their website for example in there and then also mm -hmm. be able to test against uh, different platforms which is very useful if you're uh, making a module or a plugin that you want to share with uh, with the community, for example. Um, most likely, you don't need to test your website against different uh, database uh, engines and, and CFML engines, but it allows you to take your website, have it on a certain version and of database or CFML engine, and then be easily test whether it's going to work if you switch uh, CFML engine or database engine. Uh, mm. Yeah, so it, it allows for a lot of uh, cool testing, migrations, and stuff like that to 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 be done. Do you use Command Box for that, or are you? How are you setting up that test? Um, I'm using the Command Box Docker image. Oh, cool. Yeah. Okay. Um, I uh, there's. There are a couple of environments that basically uh, spin up a container for the database and a container for, for CFML. And then mm. that CFML container is using command box because of the power and uh, the functionality around command box to easily switch uh, uh, CFML engine. Uh, mm. Yeah. Uh, you that's know, um, I don't know if you've come across the Tech Empower website where you can load up Docker images of your CMS or other framework and compare it uh, for speed against other things brad wood i interviewed brad wood about that he mm -hmm. kind of did a comparison of um cold box against uh you know running on lucy or running on adobe cold fusion against other common frameworks so that's that's um, interesting should, is something i haven't heard about but i should definitely definitely look into that yeah the tech empower they they set up this whole enormous set of dockerized things and it's not just cold fusion it's all kinds of languages and then you can do a search to see how quickly to you know how does wordpress compare to uh you know massa or how does it compare to content box mm -hmm. or whatever on speed on a realistic speed test you know anyone can write a hello world program that runs fast but when you're running a content management system it's doing d real database access and all kinds of other cool things so yeah. uh, i'll put the link to that in the show notes it was episode 125 uh, cool. or 120 i mean uh so what let, let's just talk a bit about as we wrap this episode up what what are what do you have planned in the future um good question 
Um, we uh, we're still working on a longer term roadmap, uh, mm. and we definitely would like to get some input from the community and for from users for that. What what are people? What's missing? Uh, what's 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 needed? Um, it could very well be that some of the things uh, we look at some some of the things, but we might not include it as part of the core, but release it as separate plugins or modules uh, mm -hmm. as well. Um, but I think the the main focus currently is to um, to to work towards uh, a decoupled the ability to to do decoupled websites with mm. uh, Masa Masa CMS. Um, headless is already possible nowadays, uh, and decoupled would be a next step to be able. To so, for folks listening, what does de a decoupled website or CMS mean? It basically means that your your front, your website, and your administrative part are completely separated from each other, mm. um, and that way, um, uh, using using uh, the functionality uh, in in the modern front end uh, JavaScript frameworks nowadays to mm. uh, to make content available offline and to make content st statically available to have that combined with an administrative side a um the administrator where you where you edit all the content and everything but that that not every not everything needs to go through the whole workflow and the, the, sorry through the whole life cycle uh every single time yeah that um so those that's an area we're we're looking at uh how far we want to go in that direction um at the same time uh we at we are north we're very very cloud focused uh, everything we do we do or nearly nearly everything we do is is with cloud uh we're um, big believers of that um masa cms nowadays it can run perfectly in the cloud uh no problem with that but i can see definitely some um improvements coming to masa that are coming from from that feedback and that experience that we have with clouds and to make it even uh run even smoother and even better in a cloud environment yeah what would a headless uh cms mean headless means that uh, the content nowadays uh that is is available through api endpoints um, to be to be consumed as well so um a good example for that, I think I mentioned something all the way at the start. You could use Masa to manage your content, which eventually is displayed uh, inside a mobile app. Um, and then the mobile app would use the API endpoints that are available mm. in Masa to... Um, uh, it's basically running Masa without the functionality of... of uh, um, um, Without the functionality of rendering the web pages, but mm -hmm. but um, purely as a content management system um, that is consumed by other systems to to get the content uh, content out. So, if folks want to find you online, Gus, what are the best ways to track we, uh, or turn you down? Of course, we have a website. Um, okay, <laughs> which is uh, masacms.com. Uh, we're running our own website on uh, on Masa as well, of course. Um, uh, and besides that, so that's a, an important URL, masacms.com. Um, the code is hosted on GitHub. So if you go to to GitHub.com/slash/masacms, that's that's our um, that's where you can find all our, our repositories. Um, and then a third one I should definitely mention, uh, by the way, uh, on GitHub, we also use the discussions and we use the issue tracker. So if you run into a bug, um, post it there, let us know, give us the information even better, uh, fork the repository, fix it, create a pull request and give us back a pull request. Um, yeah, the benefit of open source. Yeah, indeed. Indeed. Uh, um we have discussions over there as well so if people have questions whether uh, or if they have um uh, something to share 
if they want to share a website they build in Masa, they could do that over there as well. Um, and then uh, the third uh, site that I definitely want to mention is our new documentation we're working on. It's um, it's a long and slow progress uh, because we basically need to write the documentation from the ground up for a CMS mm -hmm. that exists for years already. Um, mm -hmm. And that the documentation you can find on docs.getmasa.com. Um, and for those who are wondering, mm -hmm. our documentation is not running on Masa CMS. Oh. <laughs> and that's, there's a simple reason for that. And that is that anyone, uh, our documentation is uh, publicly available through uh, a repository on GitHub. And anyone who wants to contribute to the documentation can basically uh, fork it, install it locally, run it locally, add content with Markdown, and just push it up, pull request, and contribute back to the to the community. Cool. Well, thanks so much for coming on the show. We'll put all those sites in the show notes at terratech.com. Mm -hmm. And uh, appreciate you, all the work you're doing in the ColdFusion community and with uh, the mass or open source effort that you obviously, you and your team have been putting a lot of work into. So thank you, Gust. Thank you for, uh, for having me. Get detailed show notes on today's episode in your free CF Alive Modern Cold Fusion Guide at terratech.com. That is T E R A T E C H dot C O M. Viva la CF Alive Revolution! 